So the mesa as a geologic feature is what we call an inverted landscape. The top of the mesa today was actually more or less the bottom of a river valley millions of years ago. And what's happened as the Rio Grande Rift Zone has been widening, first sediments have been coming down from the Sangre de Cristos and filling in this widening and deepening valley. So there's several kilometers of uh, old river deposits and lake beds just layered one on top of the other. Somewhere in there we have the eruption of the Valles Caldera and the volcanoes which preceded it, which have left a number of beds of tuff, uh, including the thickest bed from the eruption of the caldera itself. More river cobbles cap that, and then on top of all of this, there is a 3.4 million year old lava flow of basalt. It's only about 50% silica, which allows it to flow for long distances. And this basalt has flowed for about 15 to 20 miles. And this basalt is much harder than all of those looser erosional sediments below it. So the hardest rock is on top. Now, because basalt is low in silica and thus low in viscosity, the areas that it capped were the absolute bottom of a river valley at the time. This has made the hardest surface at what used to be more or less the bottom of a river course, forcing rivers to go on either side of it. Over the last about 440,000 years, the Rio Grande has started cutting through the basalt plateaus, creating mesas like Mesa Prieta. Just to the north, we have another small mesa called La Mesita that was also a part of Mesa Prieta until the river meandered and cut it off. That means that with the hard stone on top not eroding, and most of the erosion happening as the river undercuts that, it creates these landslide features that are called Tariva blocks. This is a term that comes from Southwest geology, and it's essentially when you take a flat landscape, undercut, and you get a landslide that just kind of goes out like that. The whole top slumps, a small surface fault forms, and you get a widening that creates these shelves that are very characteristic of the landscape that we have here at Mesa Prieta. These are actually what create great agricultural features and also expose large flat surfaces of basalt to create the substrate that we find the petroglyphs on today. So what we've got here is a very subtle but important agricultural feature. You see, the slopes of Mesa Prieta form natural benches or terraces, and these are suitable for growing crops, catching rainwater, pooling it, and growing crops in an otherwise fairly arid landscape. One of the uh, technologies that Pueblos would use is what we call the grid garden. This leaves behind these very low walls, often in a rectangular shape, that looks like a grid or a waffle pattern. This entire area here was probably used for growing crops, certainly maize, possibly the Three Sisters, and other crops as well. And we still have evidence of that on the surface as features and as remnants of the plants themselves. So what we've got here is some of the evidence of the farming that occurred here. This is a heritage strain of maize, and the cobs actually seem to preserve very well in these arid environments. We do see these fairly frequently in areas where we have agricultural features like grid gardens and check dams. And it's just one more piece of the puzzle that tells us about how significant this place was 
and how it wasn't just a place for visual expression, but a place that was an integral part of and supported the lives of the Pueblo peoples who still live in the valley below today. the Depression era, the uh, economic recovery was known as the Works Progress Administration, or WPA. This was a part of the New Deal and tried to stimulate the U.S. economy back from the brink of utter devastation by engaging in infrastructure projects. We know WPA was out here in 1938 because of JVJ, who's uh, one of our most prolific initial writers here on the Wells Preserve. We say, see JVJ around quite a bit, which makes you wonder how much time he or she was actually spending with the WPA versus how much time JVJ was wandering off. But this actually ties this place to a very significant moment in US history one that shaped the way that the, the River Valley is today. It also marks some of the uh, first presence of English speakers in this rural area. This is also a significant moment in the historical processes that have happened here, both physically on the landscape, but also culturally in the interaction of indigenous, Spanish-speaking and English-speaking peoples who have now become a fairly diverse community living side by side. There's other historical evidence around here too. We don't know if this comes from JVJ or not, but it would not be surprising to find cans like this associated with a uh, WPA workers' camps. This cluster of boulders is amazing for a number of reasons, which have made it a very popular stop. Not only do all of these boulders originate from the same parent boulder, but together they work to tell the story of Mesa Prieta and the peoples who have visited here and called it home for nearly the entire time span that people have been in New Mexico. Many of these petroglyphs are so old that they have developed a patina, uh, which is this recoloring of the rock surface, a full patina back to the original color of the rock surface, a process which takes thousands of years. Others are much newer, such as this example right down here, which show up much more brightly. Over on the far end, we see a sort of grid or net pattern. And these complex, intricate, but very abstract geometric forms are very characteristic of what we call the desert archaic tradition. The desert archaic tradition was a wide-spanning tradition of creating petroglyphs, much as we see here, across what is now the Western United States. Because of this long time span, we have archaic images that have that full patina and others which have not fully developed it. Lighting is absolutely perfect on this one right now, and it doesn't last very long before this one disappears back into shadow. This is what I'm talking about when I say a fully developed patina, or since this is on a basalt substrate, 
basalt develops a specific type of patina called a desert varnish. So we could also say that this is fully revarnished. So we believe that this image comes from what we call the early archaic, which could be as old as 9,500 years. That said, we still don't really have a good understanding of the period before that, what's called the Paleo-Indian period, and what sort of petroglyphs they made here in New Mexico. In other places where we later on see the desert archaic tradition, we see similar geometric patterns to what we see in the early archaic here. We do know that people from the Paleo-Indian period were around here, as we've found what are called fluted points or fulsome points on Mesa Prieta. Now these are actually named for the town of Folsom in New Mexico. So we have evidence that some of the earliest peoples in New Mexico were here at Mesa Prieta. This one on top is fully revarnished and we can be certain that this is from the archaic period. Because this face faces up, it's more exposed to the weather. And so this may have fully revarnished or fully repatinated a bit more quickly than the one down below. While the patina makes it look of roughly the same age of the other fully repatinated petroglyph, the design is more typical of the middle to late archaic, with the late archaic being uh, 1500 BC to 600 AD. We have another panel just below it in shadow that is difficult to see. And so we're not exactly sure how many of these archaic period petroglyph panels are here at the Wells Preserve and on Mesa Prieta. And over time, as has happened here, we get a lovely colorful lichen colony that unfortunately encroaches into the petroglyphs and sometimes can even eat away at the rock patina uh, or even at the texture of the rock, which can reduce the visibility of petroglyphs or for things as old as the archaic period that are thousands of years old, over thousands of years, that lichen could even completely obliterate the petroglyphs. This cluster of boulders and the panels all among them work together to tell a very long story that's at least as old as the beginning of that early archaic 9,500 years ago, and at so long that it extends through the classic Pueblo period, which ended in 1598 when Oñate made contact with the Pueblos that we know today as Santa Clara and Okeowinge. We have a number of archaic, early archaic panels, as well as middle archaic, which haven't necessarily fully redeveloped their patinas, and late archaic. Even over here, we have a mixture of early to middle and late archaic, over which is superimposed a classic Pueblo image of a figure with outstretched arms, an arrow, or possibly a spear or atlatl balanced on top of their head. Together these tell a story thousands of years in the making. Even the boulders themselves, as I was pointing out the desert varnish, turns very black, but these exposed surfaces where the boulder has broken apart have not had enough time to fully darken, to fully revarnish. And so the splitting of the parent boulder into the ones that you see today happened sometime in between the first petroglyph panels made on this cluster and the last ones. 